And Paul, in, in this text here, is alluding to the words of David himself in the 143rd Psalm. And David reflects on the righteousness of God, which, like Luther of long ago, should have caused David to be fearful, to stand before a righteous God. Why? Because he is a sinner. But in Psalm 143, David uses the righteousness of God as the foundation of his hope and of his faith. He says in verse 1, Lord, hear my prayer, listen to my cry for mercy. In your faithfulness and righteousness, come to my relief. Do not bring your servant into judgment, for no one living is righteous before you. Now think about this comparison David is saying here. God is righteous, and it's on the basis of his righteousness that David pleads that God would come and rescue him. But how can a righteous God rescue David, who's a wicked sinner? It's because the righteousness of God would become his righteousness through faith. Is the Lord our righteousness that saves us? And David had some appreciation for the fact first that the, and in any attempt to abide by the works of the law and to fulfill all of the law's demands will fall in futility. We cannot keep that law perfectly. There is none righteous in the sight of God. God who is righteous must save us. And it's on the basis of His righteousness that He saves us. Not that He just simply overlooks our sin or simply forgets about it or says, well, your good works outweigh your bad. Not at all. His righteousness means that He must punish sin. Every infraction must be met. And these sins are not simply against one another. They are against God. They are eternal sins. How can a righteous God forgive wicked sinners? How can He come and rescue us? Well, it's through Christ and through what Christ has done for us at the cross. So coming back to Galatians, Paul uh, is concerned to defend the, this gospel of justification by grace through faith in Christ alone. And one of the accusations against it is that it promotes sin. And so therefore Paul responds to that in the 18th verse. He says, if I rebuild what I destroyed, then I really would be a lawbreaker. What Paul is saying here is that there is no reason to think that Christ's work at the cross and paying for sin and providing me with new life in Christ does anything to encourage sin or to open up an opportunity for sin. Rather, when we fall into sin, it's because we ourselves remain sinners. There continues to be that life of sin within us. And the one who is at fault is not Christ by any means. The fault is ours. It comes to us. And so when you see sin in life of husbands, wives, family members, members at church, pastors, elders, and so forth, it's our fault, not Christ. It's not what Christ produces within us. It's what we, in our own sin, have done. Uh, we are rebuilding that which we once destroyed. Uh, Paul uses this language to describe how, as we've been joined to Christ, we've put away works righteousness and we've put away the sinful life. We've done away with it through our union with Christ. But in sin, we begin to rebuild that very thing. And that is wrong. It's foolish. We are transgressors. And so the blame belongs to us and not to Christ. In the 19th and 20th verses, Paul speaks of this union that we have in Christ. When we are justified by grace through faith alone, we are united to Christ in His death and resurrection. This has consequences for us, not only in our justification, but also in our sanctification, in the way that we live before God. We are justified by the work of Christ. 
But having been justified, we are joined to Christ and enabled now to live for God. Live obedient lives. And here is what Paul goes on to say to explain how there's been a fundamental break with the old way of life and a tr transforming power at work within us. First, this fundamental break with the old life is described in these words, through the law I die to the law that I might live for God. Now that might seem a little bit confusing. How is it that through the law, to the law I died, actually is the Greek way of putting it. Uh, through the law I died to the law so that I might live to God. What does that mean? Well, first it goes to his experience. He, he, through his experience under the law, in trying to live in accord with the law, he saw that he could not keep that law, but rather death was the result of trying to obey that law. He could not obey it. He constantly broke that law. In his experience, he died. But what is more, through his union with Christ, he died to the law's authority over him. Christ died on the cross and fully satisfied the demands of the law. And so therefore the law has nothing more to say to Paul. Because Paul died with Christ on that cross. The law had all of its demands met in Christ. Christ has been punished for my sins, for your sins, if you are in Christ. And so therefore I have died to the law. You might think of what Paul has to say in Romans chapter 7 when he uses that analogy of a woman who is married to her husband. If her husband dies, she no longer is bound to that husband by the law of marriage. She no longer has to remain faithful to that husband who's passed on. She is now free from that law of marriage to the, her first husband and therefore free to marry another. She's died to that old law, that old requirement in view of her old relationship. Similarly, for the Christian, when we are joined to Christ, we have died to the law and its demands over us. The law has been satisfied. We have no further obligation to observe the law as a means of salvation, to earn our way before God. The law is a system of righteousness, which we observe in our own strength, has been removed from us. We no longer have that obligation. Paul says, I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live. Again, this imagery of death and union with Christ in his death on the cross. I have been crucified with Christ. How does that take place? Did you have some sort of an experience whereby in a vision or something you were joined with Christ in his death? Obviously, hopefully not. <laughs> What Paul is saying here is that Christ died on that cross as your representative. He died in your place such that his death was your death. You were united to him mystically, really, truly, by God joining you to Christ, Christ being your head and representative. And the sufferings he went there were your sufferings. He bore them for you at the cross. You have been crucified. Your old way of life, your old patterns, your old habits and so forth have been put to death there at the cross. And that would be a fundamental uh, description of the gospel for the Apostle Paul. I am crucified with Christ. And that affects my standing before God in justification and my life before God in my sanctification. I am crucified with Christ. That will dominate my life in the way I view myself. My old way is done. I no longer live. What is he saying there? Does my personality undergo a change? Am I not the same person I was before I came to faith in Christ? Uh, clearly not. We retain our personalities, our soul, our bodies. We are still the same people as we were before that moment when we are joined to Christ through faith. But we no longer live in terms of the way we once lived, after the pattern of this world, pursuing its pleasures and desires and goals. We no longer, no longer live for ourselves. I've died. I no 
longer have power over me. Just as the law no longer has power over me. I no longer answer to myself and what I desire just as I no longer answer to the law. I've died to myself. I no longer put myself in charge of my life. I yield to Jesus Christ and I live for Him. And so I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. Another profound statement. How does Christ live in me? Does He by His Spirit inhabit me? And how do I experience that? This too is part of the wonderful transformation that occurs when we are joined to Christ through faith. We rest in Him and He dwells within us. He is Emmanuel, God with us. He dwells within the heart of the believer and empowers us for godly living. Can you say that Christ lives in me? Not just simply I know about Christ, I know about the story of His life. I know that He died and rose again from the dead. That He ascended into heaven. But I know that He lives in me. You see, Paul is expressing this in the most personal of terms. It's my experience that I'm joined to Christ. That He lives within me. That He is at work within me. Changing me and leading me in the paths of righteousness. Christ lives in me. Paul goes on to say, The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Here is the one in whom Paul trusts. They were talking about justification through faith. And this faith is in Christ and in Christ alone. Now, commentators talk about the different ways of understanding this. Is it through the faithfulness of Christ that we are justified? It is certainly said that is right and true. It is Christ's faithfulness to His Father, obeying the Father for us, that saves us. It's His faithfulness, His obedience, His righteousness that saves us, not our own. At the same time, it's our faith in Christ through which we receive that faithfulness or that righteousness. We rest in Christ and Him alone. We trust in Him. And we see Him as the Son of God, the eternal one who in time took on a human body and with that body went to the cross for us. He, we believe that he's the son of God who gave himself for us, who loved us. Personally, considered us at the cross and died for us. That's too amazing to consider. But on the cross, he loved us and knew each one of us. Maybe even thought of each one of us as he bore our sins and redeemed us. He is the Son of God who loved us and gave himself for us. This is the only grounds of our justification. The Son of God taking away our sin, dying for us, loving us so much that he did this for us. No angel could do that. No mere mortal could do that. It was the Son of God who loved us. And we trust in Him. And that trust becomes the foundation for a new life. We love Him because He first loved us. You see, we're not free to live in sin anymore. We want nothing to do with that. We wish to love Christ who loved us. And so we live in service to Him. Justification by grace through faith alone provides the only sufficient motivation for a godly life. When you look at works, righteousness, obedience to the law, you can have no confidence that all your good works will ever really fully satisfy God's just demands. It is an impossible task. And so why should you be motivated to obey? When for all that you do, you may still end up rejected. Because you know deep down inside that you are a sinner. There's no real motivation for godly living. Even though there is this terror of judgment and the desire to do that which is right. In the end, it, it will frustrate you. It will enslave you. It will fill you with guilt. But in Christ, there's liberty. There's freedom. There's life. 
and Christ living in you to serve the Lord. So as Paul concludes, we do not nullify the grace of God, but Christ... Let me read what, what he says here. We do not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness could be gained through the law, Christ died for nothing. That's Paul's conclusion of the matter. If you're going to go back to works righteousness, then that has implications for you in your view of Christ and what He has done. If you wish to go into the Roman church and you enjoy all the ceremonies and the beautiful dignity of their church, their, their buildings and so forth, and you want to live a good life and be respected as a good person doing good deeds, that has implications for who Jesus Christ is and what He did at the cross. That has implications for your understanding of God's grace. Similarly with the Arminian point of view, there are consequences to what you believe for your understanding of Christ and His cross and what was effected there. Did He actually save you, provide a full atonement for sin, and with a righteousness that is perfect and complete such that nothing more needs to be added? You're saved because of what He has done. Is that the truth of the Gospel? Or is it in some way insufficient? Not quite enough. Not all there. There needs to be more. You see, there are consequences. And Paul says the doctrine of justification by grace through faith alone truly recognizes the grace of God does not set it aside or nullify it. It says it's not enough. Nor does it dismiss the death of Christ and say that He died in vain. He died for sin. He died to pay the penalty for sin. But nonetheless, people may sin. They may fall. They may even perish. Christ did not die for nothing. So Paul upholds justification. It says it alone provides for a godly life. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the work of our Savior and his death on the cross. We thank you that he went to that cross because he loved us, me. Father, thank you for this great salvation. We pray that you would help us to be clear as we proclaim it to our generation today. May many come to faith in Christ and rest in Him and in this gracious provision. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.